My guest is Dr. Harold Rode, American specialist on the Middle East. He worked as an analyst with the Pentagon for nearly three decades and discussing Islamic affairs. Dr. Rode, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here, Yochanan. What is, what is meant by the phrase Islamic warfare? It's a fascinating uh, thing, Islamic warfare. We are in a war at the moment, we in the West, with Islam. It's not a religion. It's a civilization. It's a culture. The religion is part of the civilization. Islamic warfare, from the time of the Quran, the Muslim holy book, which is in, from the 630s, is uh, anything that works in the, in, to advance Islam is okay. You can lie, you can cheat, you can say whatever you want as long as it helps advance the cause of Islam. I'm not again talking just about the religion. The religion is how you relate to God. The goal here is that the entire world will eventually become Muslim. And after we all convert to Islam, there'll be one people living in one state ruled by a caliph under Sharia, the Muslim holy law. There's only one problem with this. Muslims don't agree on who should rule, what Muslims should rule. Number two, they don't agree on what the Sharia is. Many Muslims have different views of the Sharia, some of which we in the West could frankly get along with. And number three, whose caliph is it going to be? Mine, one Muslim, or another Muslim's? They don't agree on all this. But that's the bottom line. That's what Islamic warfare, that's the goal of Islamic warfare. And the other thing is, it's not about big armies fighting each other. It's raiding parties. All of this is based on pre-Islamic Arabia, the culture there, which were small groups raiding other small groups. We in the West call that terrorism. When small groups come and they destroy or, or they, they wreak havoc, on others, they kill people in whatever way it is. There's a simple goal. It's all what Islamic warfare is. And that is to terrorize the other side, that they become afraid and they run away. When they run away, you take the property that's behind, you take their land that is left behind. And that way, you, don't, you as the Muslim force, a lot of you don't get killed that way. And that's how it works. Why do Western leaders not see it that way? Because they refuse to. There's two problems. Number one, most people in the world see the world the way they see it, and they refuse to look at it as how others look at it. Now, the smart thing, if you're sitting down and negotiating, you're talking with another person from another culture, is to learn his culture, to learn how he understands the world, and use that to get what you want done. From my experience with a lot of leaders throughout the world, in all the years I worked at the Pentagon, and afterwards, I've met many world leaders. And all I can tell you is that they simply refuse to see the world as there, as the other side sees it. And the, the result is that we make mistake after mistake after mistake. Even with the, the rising number of horrific terrorist incidents taking place in European capitals and other places around the world, they are still refusing to see it? Yes. Especially the American government. The, Ameri uh, the Obama administration won't even use the word Islamic terrorism. That's what it is. It's radical Islamic extremism. And they won't use it. Now, if you don't identify your enemy, you cannot defeat him. You know, in World War II, imagine that the, that the British were saying, we are not, we're not in a war against the Nazis or the Germans. We're in a war against U-boats. You, you don't fight an idea. You fight people. You must identify your enemy for who he is, and then you have a chance of defeating him because you must, again, know who your enemy is. America refuses, that is, the Obama administration refuses to do that. 
European governments have been so afraid because they no longer believe in themselves and in the greatness of their culture and how much they contributed to the world. They don't believe in themselves and they don't want to alienate people. But you know, I forget the name, it was a Lutheran minister in Germany under the early Nazis. I, if I have this correct, he said, at first they came for the Jews and I didn't do anything about it because I wasn't a Jew. Then they came for the Catholics. And since I'm not a Catholic, I didn't do anything. I looked the other way. And then they came for me. And by the, by the time they came for me, there was no one around to help me, to protect me. And so basically I was finished. And that's what is happening in Europe today. Is this war between Islam and the non-Muslim world, is it going to be confined to that? Or will we see a spread of Muslim against Muslim? We have both going on at the same time. Number one, from a Muslim point of view, there are only two, if you wish, countries. Dar al-Islam, the world of Islam, and Dar al-Harb, the world of war, which may be politely translated as the world which is not yet Muslim. They are internally in conflict. At times there's quiet because the Muslims are weak. And then they regroup and they move on. That's the way it was done in pre-Islamic Arabia. That's the, what, that is the basis, again, of Islamic culture. And the result is that there are no peace agreements. The word salam in Arabic, the best way you could translate this into English and be culturally correct, let's say, is the joy that a person gets by submitting to Allah's will through Islam. Islam means submission. That's the exact translation of the word. Again, we're not talking about a religion. We don't care how other people relate to God. It's their business. But when it comes to politics, and when it comes to survival, we need to care. And uh, we haven't been doing this here in the West. Can the Shiite and Sunni factions ever be united? No. They agree on a few things. They agree that the name of their God is Allah. They agree that the Prophet is Muhammad, but they don't even agree on the role of the Prophet, the Messenger of God, as it's called in Arabic. For the Shiites, it's Muhammad's cousin, first cousin, and son-in-law, same person. His name was Ali. Because Ali was married to Muhammad's daughter, Fatima. And the Imams, the descendants for the Shiites, that's Muhammad's family are the ones who should rightfully rule. The Sunnis don't accept that at all. They believe it basically should be the Meccan aristocracy the, of the city of Mecca, that they should rule. And again, since there's no peace in Islam, as the great Bernard Lewis, uh, who's now 100 years old, would say in lectures over and over again, I'm right, you're wrong, go to hell. And that is the response of Muslim against Muslim. Now, here what we have, we have with Daesh or ISIS, that for some reason the American president insists on calling ISIL all the time. We don't know why, but um, anyway, it's this organization. They are, they control a, a whole big area of people, and they're, they're Sunni Muslims, and they believe sh Shiites, because they're apostates, should die, because the punishment for for apostasy in Islam is death. But you know what? It's not only the Shiites that should die. It's the Sunnis who don't believe the way they do. So it's Sunni on Sunni murder. So the problem is they don't agree on the definition of what is Islam, what is the Sharia, and if you don't do it my way, it's the highway. And the highway to death. 